One of the greatest obstacles to crafting health and wellness is identifying and controlling inflammation. It's at the core of all complex and chronic diseases and is the driving mechanism that underlies the most common symptoms that people like you struggle to overcome. Join us as we explore cutting edge science and research to give you the information and tools you need to create the quality of life you want and deserve. And now here is the host of Inflammation Nation, Dr. Stephen Noseworthy. Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of zone two cardio and high intensity interval training. This is part eight of our mini series on longevity and health span. So in the last episode, I shared with you that you have four, three or four, depending on how you classify the first two, but let's say three energy systems that fuel your activity and exercise. And, and we use two major muscle fiber types to do those things. And I shared that the demands of any activity or exercise literally determines which muscle fiber types you use or the balance between the two and also which energy system dominates that you can tap into to fuel the activity or the exercise in question. For example, zone two cardio, like this low intensity steady state cardio that most of us are doing. Um, uses predominantly slow twitch type one muscle fibers, and it uses the mitochondria to create energy by burning mostly fats and some glucose in the presence of oxygen. That's how we fuel these activities like this long duration, low intensity, steady state work. On the other hand, high intensity interval training or zone five training, which I also do, requires more power. And to serve that, you tap into your fast twitch type two muscle fibers and you shift your energy production away from the mitochondria outside into a part of the cell called the cytosol and um, away from using fats to burning pretty much exclusively glucose outside of the mitochondria and without the use of oxygen. And this is what we call glycolysis or, or maybe more te technically anaerobic glycolysis. And I made the point that the average person has about a 50-50 split between slow twitch endurance muscle fibers and fast twitch speed and power muscles. And I also made the point that you can tailor your exercise to preferentially develop one system or the other. And that the ideal for health and wellness is to actually have capacity in both systems. It's not either or, unless you're a highly specialized athlete of either a marathon type or uh, say an Olympic lifter or a power lifter. You need to be able to tap into fats for low intensity, long duration work. You need to tap into glucose to provide power for shorter bouts of much more intense uh, and hard output work and exercise. And, and this is what we mean by metabolic flexibility, right? It's functional capacity in both of these systems. One of the things that many of you listening struggle with, at, at least in part, with things like daily fatigue or brain fog, for example, is coming from poor VO2 max. We've covered that in other episodes and a compromised ability to use your mitochondria and to use fuel with oxygen. I'm sorry, fats with oxygen as your primary fuel source. And the two main contributors to this might be an inappropriate carb dominant diet with a loss of insulin sensitivity combined with a poor VO2 max. And, and these are easily fixed, <laughs> but it takes motivation and it takes effort. And the question for you as an individual is, is it worth it for you? You have to answer that question for yourself. So today we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're still talking about training types, zone two, zone five, or high intensity work. Um, we're going to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages as we work our way towards probably another episode where we'll talk about how you put training together. Like how do you actually do zone two training? How do you do high intensity intervals? So let's talk about the advantages of zone two first. The first advantage of zone two training is that it's easier to start here for someone who is sedentary or deconditioned or metabolically compromised because it requires less from your body than zone five work. Zone five work is hard by design. If you're metabolically compromised and sedentary, zone two work can be hard because it's new and your body has to adapt and expand its capacity. But nevertheless, if you're getting started and if your goal is eventually to do both some zone two and some zone five training or some combination of those things, 
then the zone two training, the low intensity stuff is easier to get started with because it's less rigorous. It demands less, but it still does demand the capacity to use your type one muscle fibers and to burn fat as a fuel source. And many of you listening, I know are compromised in that. How would you know that you're compromised in that? Well, if you're the, the person who doesn't tolerate um, low carbohydrate diets, if you don't tolerate things like intermittent fasting, you have to eat or snack all the time to keep your energy and your blood sugar stable, you have a compromised zone two capacity, right? That's a, that's a key indicator. And it just so happens that those are the same indicators of people who have things like reactive hypoglycemia or functional reactive hypoglycemia. So advantage number one of zone two, easier to get started, less demanding although it still presents a demand. The second advantage of zone two training, there's a wide variety of exercise modalities that you can use. You're not locked into one thing. So you can find something that you like and finding something you like and will stick to makes zone two training easier. It makes it more enjoyable. You can walk or you can jog if you're, you're able to jog and you can do that inside or outside. You can use an elliptical machine. You can use a stepper or a rower, or you can swim if you're a swimmer, or you can dance, or you can do Zumba or cardio kickboxing and so on. And so the list is not quite literally endless, but the list is very long. Any activity that raises your heart rate into an appreciable zone two target zone is going to work for you. It is going to help you build that capacity. So try to pick something that you enjoy. You've heard me say before, it's almost always good for us, if not better for us, to do things that we're not used to, perhaps that we don't enjoy and learn to enjoy those things. But if you're just getting started, pick something you like, pick something that is going to challenge that zone two system and do your best. Like whatever it is that you're going to stick to or more likely to stick to, that's important. The third advantage, and, and this is the big one, is that since the power output is low, Again, your body fuels zone two type activity by using mostly fat as an energy source. So remember that at rest, you use mostly fat for fuel plus a tiny bit of glucose. And the same is true as you increase your energy output into zone two. Now that obviously starts to change as you get into zone three training with higher energy demands and higher work output, you have to start tapping into glucose. So there's a limit to maximizing or optimizing your fat burning capacity. So when you act, when your activity or your exercise keeps you in zone two, you're literally teaching your body, you're training your body to be more efficient at using fat as a fuel source, which can be very helpful in weight loss efforts. I know not everyone has that as a goal, but many do, particularly as we head towards the new year. And it also improves energy levels in general, because again, at rest, you're using mostly fat as a fuel source. And if you're inefficient at that, you're going to be tired and your brain's not going to work throughout the day. We have many recent studies that show that as you increase your cardio intensity, again, there's a point at which you switch muscle fiber type usage from your fat loving type one fibers to your glucose loving type two fibers. And this is essentially the definition of, of the upper limit of zone two. It's the exercise intensity that maximizes your mitochondria's ability to burn fat as a fuel using oxygen before you have to enter into zone three, which is where you start to access your type two fibers, which create energy predominantly from glucose. In zone two, fat burning is high and glucose burning is there, but it's very low. And a lot of this depends on your VO2 max and your oxygenase and capacity. The fitter you are, the more fat you burn for longer periods of time and during higher intensity. So again, your VO2 max is very important for many different reasons. In zone three, fat burning is there, but it starts to reduce. But now in zone three, we get more glucose utilization relative to the whole because we're working again at higher energy output than zone two and the zone two system can provide. And that discrepancy gets worse as we go from the lower end of zone through three to the higher end of zone three, approaching zone four and, and eventually into zone five and six depending on how you classify the zones, where we can literally see fat burning go down to zero. Zero percent of your energy comes from fat at, some, at very, very high intensities. 100% comes from glucose or glycogen. In zone four, all of the energy we're producing is coming from, or I should say most, if not all, the energy we're producing is coming from burning glucose, right? Without using the mitochondria and, and fat burning gets minimized, 
once we hit five, zone five, essentially we eventually get to that point where fat burning literally sh shuts off because fat cannot provide energy quickly enough to fuel the activity. Everything is running glucose, again, without using the mitochondria, without using oxygen. Now, you might be sitting there saying to yourself, why, why would I ever want to exercise at higher intensities than zone two if I want to burn body fat? And it's a, it's a logical question. On the surface, it makes sense until you factor in that while high intensity training may, may not use a lot of fat during the activity itself, at least as a relative percentage, the post-exercise use of fat tends to be higher for the rest of the day. This is one of several reasons why the fastest sprinters in the world are all very well muscled, but extremely lean people. It's not just an enhancement of fat um, burning throughout the rest of the day. It's the fact that when you do high intensity activity, you burn more total calories. And yes, total calories in, total calories out matters. It's all part of the equation, but it's not the only part of the equation. So it is helpful to distinguish between the energy demands of the exercise itself as well as the effect that any training has in the post-exercise period over a long period of time. That's where you get your adaptation. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and abandon the thought of high-intensity interval training or zone 5 training simply because your goal might be to lose body fat. And you just heard me say when you get up to high-intensity work, you're burning glucose and you're not burning fat. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So those are the advantages of zone two training. The most important for this discussion is the impact of zone two training, not just on the number of mitochondria your muscles have, but on their ability to efficiently use oxygen to burn fat. That's probably the most critical aspect for this discussion. The key thing to know is that the higher your VO2 max is, the more you can use fat for fuel, even when higher, when using higher intensity workloads. Conversely, if your VO2 max is very low and you have a limit on your mitochondria's ability to use oxygen and fat, then even the slightest increase in intensity will shift you out of fat burning into glucose burning. And in fact, there, there are some of you right now who are so inflamed, you're so metabolically deranged that simply walking to your front yard or walking up a flight of steps, which should be zone one intensity, actually shifts you out of fat burning into glucose burning. And again, this just highlights the importance of VO2 max for so many different reasons. Okay, what about the disadvantages of zone two training? There's probably more than this. Where I'm going to talk about two, what I see as the two main disadvantages of, of zone two training. And one of them simply is my own issue. The first, again, and this is my issue, is that for some people like myself, I find long, slow cardio to be mind numbing and boring. Right, that I can think of a few things that are less palatable than getting on a treadmill or an elliptical machine, which I tend to prefer, and going for an hour to an hour and a half. Like I just the only the only way that that makes it any any way pal palatable to me is, you know, to listen to podcasts or audiobooks or some do some kind of learning where my mind is engaged. Um, having said that, some people love that. They love the long, slow zone two work. They go. They get on cruise control and they just let their minds wander to whatever suits them and they can go and go and go and go. Again, I, I shared with you last time that I tend towards the fast twitch, high power side of things. I, I played sprinting and jumping sports for most of my life. For me, zone two is a brain killer, but it's important. So I do it anyways, because I know that it gives me things that I want. It's a means to an end. And like I said, the only way I can handle long periods of time doing zone two and I typically do this listening at one and a half to two times speed, listen to a podcast, listen to an audiobook. You know, again, I have to engage my brain or else I just, I go out of my mind. So my body, my brain is constantly telling me to speed things up. And partly that's because how I train myself in the sports that I played over the years, but also because I find the hard and fast stuff immensely gratifying. My brain likes it. My mind likes that stuff. But I realize not everyone struggles with this, right? So like I said, when I do a zone two session, I'm constantly, constantly, I'm listening, I'm learning, um, but I'm also constantly checking my work output using a heart rate monitor. I use a, an Apple iWatch um, and just constantly checking my, 
my heart rate as a guide to keep myself in check because left to my own device, devices, I will, in a very subconscious way, start increasing the pace and increasing the intensity to the point where I'm in zone five and I didn't even think about it. That's just because my natural gravity. So I have to keep checking my heart rate to make sure that I slow myself down and take my time and make sure that I don't get out of the zone two into three, four, and eventually five. Again, this is not an issue for some people. And if, if that's you, then God bless you. That's wonderful, wonderful for you. Um, and this, this actually relates to this, the second disadvantage of zone two. And the benefits are amazing, but the time required to get the adaptations of increased mitochondrial density or, or number or efficiency, it's on the long side of things. And that's why some people call zone two low and slow exercise. And how long does it take? Well, if you look at the national guidelines on exercise, they say that you should do 150 minutes of zone two cardio every week. And some experts say that it takes a minimum of 45 minutes per session to really see the benefits. So you you need to be doing multiple 45 minute zone two sessions per week to meet the minimum requirement that the experts stay is what's going to develop and maintain a VO2 max that's good for you. And if that turns you off in some way, because you, you either don't see how you can spend the time or you don't want to just hang in there, right? There are ways to hack the system, so to speak, so that you can actually get the same benefit by doing less. And that's the advantage of science and paying attention to science is because we can tool things around to our liking, but still get the same outcome. So 150 minutes of zone two each week amounts to three or four 40 to 45 minute zone two sessions per week. And if you're currently inactive or never really had a habit of exercise, I know this sounds like a big ask. It's a lot, but remember why you should do it, right? It is how you can improve your VO2 max and reduce your risk of dying of all causes. We covered that in a previous episode with mortality. It's also how you increase blood vessel formation and blood flow to your muscles and to your heart, which improves the delivery of oxygen and nutrients, as well as the removal of metabolic waste products. All good stuff. It's also how you teach your muscles again to use fat efficiently as a fuel source, even at higher exercise intensities that would otherwise shift you out of fat burning into glucose utilization. All right. So those are the disadvantages. Let's transition now to the advantages of zone five training or high intensity work, high intensity intervals. One of the biggest advantages of high intensity interval training or zone five slash zone six work is that it is very time efficient. <laughs> you just have to go really hard, really fast for a short period of time. Um, when it comes to building your VO2 max, again, increasing the number, the size, and the function of your mitochondria, improving blood flow, high intensity inter interval training does the same job as zone two. So there's commonality between the two approaches. The advantage of, of zone five or high intensity work is that it just takes less time to get the same results. And that's a good thing. And, and that is perhaps the biggest advantage for zone five or high intensity interval training. And for me specifically, again, because I'm geared to this genetically and by training, I love hard and fast exercise. I have no problem if someone says, hey, meet me at the gym or out in the field. We're going to do a hit training session and we're going to go, forgive the language, balls to the wall. And you're going to be in a puddle of sweat and, and panting and heaving. I'm like, bring it on. Like, that's exactly what I like to do. Now, for comparison purposes... If it takes 150 minutes of zone two work per week to hit your mark, national guidelines also say that you can do that or you can do 75 minutes, literally half the time, of moderate to vigorous activity. And sometimes we can get tripped up in the language. Like what's moderate, what's, what's vigorous, is vigorous high intensity? Like how do all these relate? Just try to simplify it. Right. So you can either do 150 minutes of low and slow zone two cardio, or you can do 75 minutes total of moderate to high intensity work and get the same results. And that's a significant reduction in the time that you need to invest. And so one of the strategies in trying to figure out how you're going to improve your VO2 max in the year 2024, if you are limited on time, your best option is to do two to three sessions of zone five or interval training. And we'll talk about how we put those things together probably in the next episode. 
Now, so far, we've only talked about low intensity zone two, high intensity zone five work. So moderate intensity work is a new part of the framework, right? We've been building this mental framework so you can help understand all these concepts and know where to hang all these details. And I'm going to go over that again a little later ne next episode when we start to talk about how do we put this all together into actual practical, what do I do if I go to the gym, for example? So the main advantage of high intensity zone five is time. It just takes less, less, it doesn't take less effort. It takes less time to do it. The second major advantage is metabolic. When you train your muscles and your body with higher intensity, shorter periods, higher intensity, over time, you teach your muscles to handle and clear metabolic waste more efficiently. And it is a great way to teach your body how to handle glucose and the carbohydrates in your diet. So if you are struggling with some degree of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, maybe you're a pre-diabetic type 2 diabetic, increasing the intensity, decreasing the time invested, but pushing hard is perhaps the best way. If not, it is the best way to teach your body how to handle carbs if you want to continue eating carbs. Now, maybe you're going to decide, well, I'm going low carb in 2024. I'm going to go keto. All those are potentially great choices. But I'll tell you this, that from an exercise standpoint, the only way to train your body to be able to handle carbohydrate loads is to, number one, do zone two cardio training and number, I'm sorry, zone five cardio training and high intensity intervals and to begin resistance training, to get stronger, to grow your muscles and improve their ability to store glucose. Again, it's a whole different topic and we'll cover that when we get a chance to talk about resistance training probably in another mini series, just all on its own. But back to the second major advantage of, of zone five and high intensity work, it's metabolic. And again, it relates to glucose control, glucose tolerance, and it teaches your body how to handle the metabolic waste product that comes from having a carbohydrate based diet. Now you may have heard of things like lactate or lact lactic acid. Uh, in the past, this was blamed for the muscle burn that you sometimes feel with certain types of exercise, like higher intensity, higher load stuff. And initially, lactate and lactic acid was thought to be a bad thing. Uh, and that high intensity, because high intensity exercise increases lactic acid, this causes the burn and this limits your ability to continue exercising. And, and so for decades, endurance athletes did what they call lactate threshold or lacto lactate tolerance training. And, you know, basically the thought, which was somewhat misguided, was that the more you train at this higher level, the more your body learns to tolerate the lactic acid buildup. N not entirely true. Um, what, it turns out that this initial explanation was just a little bit off the mark. And it turns out that the lactate created by using glucose without oxygen, this anaerobic glycolysis, and that happens outside the mitochondria, using that process to make energy, um, allows the body to use lactate produced from high energy work to bind to what are called hydrogen ions, which are acids, to buffer their acidity. And the burn actually comes from the acidity of these hydrogen ions, which are, again, produced by glycolysis. And furthermore, this lactate can actually be shuttled from your fast twitch type 2 muscle fibers that produce them to your slow twitch type 1, where the slow twitch zone two type muscles actually can use the lactate made by the high intensity zone five type two muscles for their own purpose. And I know that was a little twisty and windy, but the two systems are interlinked. So let me just kind of restate it. If you use high intensity interval training and in, 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 so, in doing so, you're using your high energy glucose based systems in your type two muscles, you're going to produce these hydrogen ions and this lactate as metabolic waste products or byproducts. And those waste products and byproducts are, are not necessarily the same. Metabolic waste products are byproducts, but not all byproducts of metabolism are actually waste products that we need to handle and clear, like hydrogen ions, for example. So the advantage is, is that when you, when you train with high intensity uh, and intervals, that zone five stuff, you train your body to more efficiently bind these metabolic waste products so that they don't mess you up. And it increases your exercise capacity. If you have exercised in the past, you realize that at some point, 
the amount of exercise you can do before you get tired increases. And so you end up doing more work in the same time or you do more total work and more total time. These are signs of adaptations and signs of increased capacity and handling metabolic waste products via zone five training is part of that process. This is really cool because again, it tells us and shows us that type one and type two muscle fibers and the energy systems they use either oxygen and fat in the, in the mitochondria or glucose without oxygen outside the mitochondria, these systems are interlinked. And it's not either or, they both work at the same time. They're interdependent to a certain extent. And we need to train them both if we are to uh, expect to get metabolic flexibility. In fact, you should never ever really think that zone two and zone five exercise are mutually exclusive. Rather, you should think of them as interlinked gears, like the gears on a bicycle, for example, you know, you, you put your feet on the pedals on a bicycle and you push the pedals and that turns one wheel that's linked by a chain to another wheel and it turns the other wheel, right? That's how these systems actually work. And as, as you engage one energy system, it has an effect on the other. And con conversely, a problem in one energy system will translate into a problem with the other system. And, you know, remember that with the exception of the extremes, you're always burning some balance of fat and glucose or carbohydrates. It is only at the extremes of intensity, high intensity, really high intensity work that fat burning shuts off and you end up burning 100% glucose. If we go to the opposite extreme of sleep, which is the, the lowest demand activity that we can engage in, at most about 70% of your energy, probably more like 60%, during sleep, 60% of your energy comes from fat. You're still burning glucose while you're sleeping. To say it another way, a very high intensity exercise can shut off fat burning for a period of time so that 100% of your fuel comes from sugar or glucose. But you will never ever completely shut off glucose utilization so that you're burning nothing but fat as your primary fuel source or your only fuel source. So it works in one direction, it doesn't work in the other. The takeaway is that zone five is very time efficient and it is critically interlinked with zone two. They're interlinked and independent, interdependent, and you need capacity in both systems. All right, what about the disadvantages of zone five high intensity work? Well, there are two main disadvantages of zone five high intensity that I can see. First is if you are already very metabolically compromised, you may be able to do a high intensity workout, but you run the risk of crashing yourself metabolically when you're done. And what I mean by that is that you might, you know, maybe you've had to give up exercise altogether because you just can't tolerate it. Or maybe you can still exercise, but you realize that it's very easy to overdo it. And when you do, you crash for days. Like you get up the next day and you're like, oh, I just got hit by the bus and it's days before you can go back and try to do the exercise again. If, if that's you, you have to be very careful in implementing zone five work. You either have to modify it or delay it and do your zone two work first and build a base before you introduce it. Zone five, um, referring to that. Or again, you, you have to modify zone five and higher intensity interval training so that you can perform and recover rather than perform and crash. That's really critically important. So you can use lower intensity during work intervals and give yourself more active rest time. That's an important strategy, as well as paying attention to how many intervals you do in one session and how many sessions you do per week. Back in the 1980s, some German researchers came up with what's called the 10 by one protocol that they use to rehabilitate cardiac patients, uh, people with you know congestive heart failure of that open heart surgery. Uh, basically, they exercised as hard as they could for one minute, and then they did active rest for another minute, and they repeated that for 10 times, 10 cycles. So it was 10 rounds of one minute hard, one minute of active rest. Now, hard doesn't mean perhaps the hard that you and I can produce because they can only do so much. And so they pushed as hard as they could, and then they rested. They pushed as hard as they could. And then over time, how hard they could push increases and so on. Um, so, but even though it's, 
you know, several days a week and, and a 10 by one protocol, nobody says that you can't start doing it maybe twice a week and work up. Maybe instead of doing 10 cycles of one on and one off, you start with three and then you go to four and then you go five all the way up until you're actually doing 10 repeats of a 10 by uh, a one by one protocol. Again, there's no rule that says that you can't follow your one minute of hard work with two to three minutes of rest. Instead of doing 10 minutes of one and one, you're doing 10 minutes of one minute of hard work, two to three minutes of rest. So the point is, is that no matter what your capacity is right now, there's something that you can do, some protocol that you can take and modify that fits your circumstance and your capacity that will allow you to grow your capacity. And the rule is start low, be patient because it takes time to build capacity. The second and the last disadvantage I want to point out is that for a lot of people, this idea of going balls to the wall is, is not an appealing prospect. Right now, it's not a disadvantage for me and people who are wired like me. I love to push the boundaries. I love to feel absolutely drained after a workout. But if that's not you, that's fine. Just don't let it stop you. Because here's an important truth. I, I hinted at this earlier. Sometimes your best opportunity for success and improvement is in doing things that you don't like and things that you're not good at. And for me, that means I suck it up and I slow it down and I do some zone two work every week. For you, it might be the opposite. For you, it might be sucking it up and pushing hard once in a while because there are adaptations that you get from zone five high intensity work that you can't get anywhere else. All right, so far, I've been helping you develop a mental framework to understand the changes that zone two and zone five training can give you. And today we covered some of the disadvantages and the advantages of both of these. The next part of the framework is to help you to understand, like, how do I know if I'm in zone two, right? If zone two training is your goal, how do you know you're there? What are the guidelines? How do you start? How do you monitor it? And also in the next episode, we'll be covering that, but we'll also be talking about uh, recommendations on structuring zone two and zone five workouts. And then we're going to talk about some of the magic that happens when you combine these into more moderate intensity interval training. So guys, stay tuned. Um, happy new year. We're just days away from the cusp of 2024. I hope you stay safe and enjoy yourself. And we'll see you next time on the Inflammation Nation. Thanks for listening to Inflammation Nation. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast. Be the first to know when a new episode drops so you can stay on top of your game. It also helps others like you find the answers they need. You can use the links in the episode description to check out Dr. Noseworthy's self-learning programs for thyroid, detox, and gut health. Or you can submit a question for the podcast and even reach out to Dr. Noseworthy directly.